what was the impact of sort of all these cumulative decisions? What what was the membership sort of at its peak of our LDS Community of Christ, and where is it today? And if you had to describe the consequences of all these changes, what has it done to the church, hmm. positively and negatively? Yeah. Well, that the the answer to that has several elements to it. Um, the community of Christ has continued to grow membership-wise throughout this whole time, but it's been growing internationally. So the primary growth has not been in the Western world, but it's been in other parts of the world. So overall, the membership has has continued to uh, increase. So it, you've offset loss, domestic losses with international conversions? If you're just looking at numbers okay. of, of members, it's it's very different realities in some ways. In the United States, Canada, Australia, British Isles, uh, the membership has slowly declined, kind of following the track of some mainline churches, and we're impacted by some of the same cultural factors. We did have several migrations of members out of active participation in the RLDS church uh, following the approval of the ordination of women to the priesthood. Now that was kind of a culmination, in my opinion, of a lot of the issues that had been discussed in the late 60s, the 70s, and the early 80s. But that kind of became the, the break point uh, for some people, women in the in the priesthood. And around what year was that? 84, that was uh, approved. Um, and about a year later, first ordinations um, of women to the priesthood. The um, experience in the church that I think has been most difficult is that of people choosing to develop what they call independent branches or congregations of the RLDS church and wanting to take the name of the church with them, RLDS. Um, and that has split families and congregations. And those groups say that they are wanting to be the RLDS church with its original doctrines as during the time of the early reorganization. So they're kind of fundamentalists. They're fundamentalist RLDS, Community of Christ, who got to a point that they felt they needed to separate. Some are still formally on the church's membership roles, but they participate in these groups where they say they're not under the auspices of, of community of Christ. And I've heard various estimates of the number of, of members, but given our relative size, um, it, it was fairly significant. So I've you're in the hundreds of thousands, is that right? About 250,000. Worldwide. Worldwide members with a nose count. We know a lot more people are in church than that, especially in places like Haiti or Africa, but they're not just haven't joined the church or the, our records haven't caught up to what's happening in those congregations. So there was uh, a departure from the church 80s and 90s, but at the same time, we experienced some people becoming more active in the church and new people joining the church because we made the decision to ordain uh, women. But overall, there was an impact on numbers of members and church finances from that, that decision. Recently, uh, when in some nations we approved uh, the ordination of homosexuals in same-sex relationships and marriage where it's legal or a covenant ceremony where marriage is not legal. It was predicted 
that we would have another mass migration that would put the church uh, in a very difficult situation. That has not happened. Uh, some people have left. And there's been some impact on church finances, but not as much as some said it would be if we made those decisions. Um, but it's mainly relational, uh, hard feelings from people who felt, uh, they basically say, uh, you know, I didn't leave the church, the church left me. So they understood the church in a one true church model and is being very static and just persisting no matter what the circumstances may be. Uh, and, and they feel hurt. We have made very uh, several very sincere attempts to reach out to reconcile. Some have reconciled, but it's usually on an individual and family basis, not on a congregational basis. So there has been pain. Now, how we've been blessed is this whole cadre of gifts and sensitivities in ministry that women have brought to the church. And they've become pastors. Uh, they've become jurisdictional leaders, uh, what we call mission centers, groups of congregations. They're in every leadership group of the church. And the perspectives they bring have, in, in my opinion, given us a better understanding of the full depth of the, of the gospel, the nature of God. Um, and it's helped us be grow and be better in our understanding of what God's about in the world. So, so talk a bit more about how having female leaders and pastors has benefited the church. Well, do you have, do you have stories, examples? <laughs> sure. I have a uh, counselor in the First Presidency who's, who's female. She is very sensitive to individuals or groups that may feel excluded. And so in the presidency, whenever we're discussing an issue, be it pastoral or practical, administrative or doctrinal, she's always bringing a perspective of what it's like to be the minority or to be the marginalized or what it's like to be female in a world where patriarchy <laughs> is still dominant in a lot of ways. That enriches our discussion. And as much as I, as a male, would try to be sensitive, I think only a female could really bring that perspective and that experience. Same thing in the Council of Twelve, in the bishopric of the church, pastors, uh, there's a type of sensitivity and compassion uh, that I think has really helped us with the uh, issues related to homosexuality that maybe a lot of men didn't have the capacity before, but the female perspective has, has really helped us on issues of sexuality and sexual orientation and deep sensitivity to relationships. And so we've been enriched by that in all aspects of, of the church. So the church has been enriched by having female yes. leadership at all levels. Yes, uh, it has. And even in countries that are still strongly male dominated and Christianity is clearly male dominated to have an alternative there among those expressions of Christianity is extremely valued. So I've traveled to Haiti and Africa and, and uh, in Asia and I talk to our members. I just ask them, why are you a part of this movement? And some of them are new members who have come from other religions. Some have come from other churches. 
and, and they list several things. Uh, they talk about our emphasis on the worth of all persons. So they're coming from societies where females are subservient or there's a strong caste system which we would not recognize in the church. And that is so valuable to them as human beings. And that the notion that they could become an ordained minister is just phenomenal to them and extremely freeing in terms of fulfilling their potential as children of, of God. So that's very important to them. Uh, the way we express it is all are called according to their gifts, worth of all persons, unity in diversity, not to do away with diversity. And that is picked up as a very life-affirming, person-affirming, community-affirming message throughout the world. Is there anything that would preclude a, a female from being called as president prophet at no. this point? Do you envision that that might happen at some point? Yes, yes. Okay. Would you like to see that happen? Yes. You would? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. I, I think uh, even though a member of the presidency is, is uh, a female, that when a female becomes prophet president of the church, uh, that will truly signal uh, that there's no role, there's no office, there's, there's no responsibility that's not open and available to anyone according to their gifts and desires and God's call. So again, in community of Christ, it's emphasis on who is God calling? And God can, can call people from very surprising life circumstances. Mm -hmm to serve in ministerial roles. Okay. Um, what about people of color in leadership? Is that, is that a reality in Community of Christ? Is that, how has that, um, how has that been for the church yeah. to, to have diversity of leadership? Well, it's certainly a reality. Talk, Talk about, about the and in racial composition yeah. of like the Quorum of the Twelve or the Seventy or. Sure. First presidency or whatever. In the, uh, in the Council of Twelve, uh, we have uh, an apostle who's African, a very good friend of mine. He's from Zambia. Um, we also have an apostle who's from Central America, Honduras. Uh, we have uh, an apostle who is from French Polynesia, uh, a woman. Uh, so the, the spectrum of color is in the leadership councils of the church. Uh, in the presidents of 70, right now we have 10 quorums of 70 organized around the world. There are presidents of the missionaries of the church who are from uh, Africa, uh, Asia, you know, Central America. Uh, when we meet as church leadership, we use three languages. So everything's being translated uh, French, Spanish, and English so that we can uh, communicate with each other. Um, and I expect that that diversity of culture and, and races will just continue to occur. Uh, of course, we have male and female um, in the leadership councils and quorums of the church. Throughout the church, uh, we have congregations, <clears throat> excuse me, that are diverse in terms of cultural makeup, depending on where they're, they're located. Uh, we have congregations that are all Hispanic or all African American. Uh, we have congregations that are all Anglo. It kind of reflects the local culture but we encourage all of our congregations to reach out to include diversity as a positive expression of, of, the, of the church. So that's a value that we, we hold. Um, in terms of racial issues, um, just after the Civil War era, 
Joseph Smith III indicated through Revelation that we shouldn't be hesitant in ordaining people using the term of the, of the time of the Negro race when a lot of people were saying to him, don't move too quickly on this. There's a lot of tension in the country. And there had been African-American members uh, of the church prior, prior to that, certainly. So uh, in terms of racial issues, our people of hu are human. So there were struggles. <laughs> uh, there were struggles in the Deep South uh, during the Civil Rights era. Uh, but we as a church tried to be prophetic in our stances and then help the church align with the vision of racial equality and inclusivity. Now, the human nature still comes through, and people struggle with that. But overall, that's the trajectory of the church, and we have evidence of we're moving more and more in that direction. So for our traditions, 1978 was the big year. For you, was there a big year? Was it just post-Civil War? It kind of... Right after the Civil okay. War. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice, nice job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, as you may have heard, there were three vacancies in our quorum of 12 recently. Mm -hmm. Many of us were hoping that the church would see that as an opportunity for some people of color to be called. Um, that didn't happen. Not only did that not happen, it was three white males from Utah. Um, and honestly, I was very surprised. Like. That I, I, it felt such a bold thing in 2015 with with the church that's so global to continue on that trend of only calling white males from Utah, Idaho sort of into the Quorum of the Twelve. Um, can you talk a little, and this, maybe for you, this is an obvious question, but can you just talk about the importance of having a racial diversity at the highest levels of mm -hmm. why is that valuable why is it how is that enriched uh community of christ yeah broader perspective and greater understanding helps us better understand god's nature and will so we would believe that the diversity that is evident in creation is a reflection of god's nature and so having diversity in the church and having diversity in the leadership of the church helps us draw closer to understanding God's nature and will. So there's blessing in there. There's struggle to understand issues from various perspectives. But I understand that as a white male I am privileged in society and in the church in ways that I don't even fully comprehend. And it's only when there are people from other experiences who are given the opportunity and empowered to speak and share their perspective and their truth from their life experience do I get a much better understanding of the nature of God, what the focus of ministry should be. We, we need to listen to the marginalized people. That's where Jesus would be. That's who he would be having food with. That's who he would be talking to. So they actually help us grow closer and understand better where Jesus is at work in the world today from their life experience. But the richness of cultures and, and languages uh, that help us see issues from various perspectives is so much better than, than just being monolithic or monochromatic it, it, or homogeneous. Uh, well, in nature itself. Um, I mentioned I was initially trained as an ecologist biologist. Diversity 
is considered to be a healthy ecosystem because it can survive and thrive in changing circumstances. It's, it's when there's too much uh, sameness that systems and uh, get in trouble. So even from a, a practical scientific perspective, diversity is a strength and a, and a blessing. But most of all, I, I sit in church leadership meetings and we're talking about issues. And uh, my African friend, Bunda Chibwe, who's an apostle in the Council of Twelve, he'll sit back and listen because that's important in his culture. And then he'll begin to speak from an African perspective. And I'll say, I never understood life that way. And I never understood that dimension of the gospel in that way. And I've been blessed. Or Mareva Arnaud, apostle from French Polynesia, to speak from an island culture and to talk about their sense of community and generosity, which is so different than Western individualism and greed. I'm blessed. I'm enriched. The church is blessed and enriched. So someday uh, a president prophet who's a person of color as well? Yes. Oh, yes. I just assume that. <laughs> you, would, you, would, you would welcome that? Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, I think that would be great. Okay. <laughs> great. Um, so there's, I really want to get to what it means to be a prophet in your tradition and what revelation means and what scripture means in your tradition. Before we do that, I want to briefly touch on just some high level matters of doctrine. And I want to do it in this way. There's a, so, um, you know, we know that, you know, you're going to have whatever birth rate you have and whatever whatever conversions you have, domestic and international, you'll have that. And your church will hopefully grow at some growth rate, maybe one or 2% a year. Does that sound right? Yeah. Um, and, but, but there's this broader world out there, right? And the broader world is within the LDS church, um, there are uh, high numbers of, of people disaffecting from, from the church. There's still a decent growth rate because of birth rate, but there's a very low retention rate internationally. And some are wondering whether within a good 10 to 20 year period, that growth is going to sort of flatten. It's definitely slowed already for us. It's some, some are saying it's going to flatten and maybe even start decreasing within a 20 to 30 year time period. Uh, and, you know, internationally, of course, as long as we have money, we could send out missionaries and grow the church uh, internationally. But, but what we know is that in the Western world, in, in Western Europe, in, in developed Asia, and definitely in the United States and Canada, outside of sort of restoration sort of discussion, there's a broad trend towards secularization. While the Catholic Church may still be slightly growing because of birth rate and immigration, we know that mainline Christianity is in trouble, as I understand it, in terms of membership decline. We know that the, from the Pew Foundation that uh, those who no longer affiliate with any religious tradition are, are the largest and the fastest growing group of, of any religious group. We call those the nuns, N-O-N-E. And just as we've seen in Western Europe, sort of churches on the decline, that's the environment in the United States and in developed Western world. So it's a tough time to be a church, a Christian church. Um, and then add to that, you know, my understanding of the LDS tradition, which is, is that over half of those who, who leave uh, the LDS church uh, end up becoming, identifying as atheist or agnostic. They don't even like just go, okay, well, We'll put the Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon aside. They put the whole enchilada aside. And it's like atheism and secularism and Jesus is just, you know, maybe he lived, maybe he didn't. Bible is just as fallible as the Book of Mormon. And, 
you know, it's very common for there to be just sort of a complete dismissal of religion altogether, almost an allergic reaction where it's like, I'm never stepping in in the within the walls of a church again. I'm not interested in anything and especially not building on a restoration tradition when I know so many unpleasant things about Joseph. So, um, you know, that's, you know, a lot of my listeners are in this boat, uh, just lost all appetite for religion. So I'm gonna ask you at just a very high level, I'm gonna go through some major religious beliefs and ask what community of Christ has to offer in 2015 about some basic teachings that context. So for example, many are atheists today. Um, and if not atheist, definitely a very small g sort of version of God, which is maybe there's some energy or power or force in the universe, call that God or not, but, um, but the, sort of the anthropomorphic idea of a God is certainly losing favor amongst the people I talk to and sometimes the idea of any God whatsoever. What does Community of Christ have to offer about a view of God that could speak to a, a millennial or a disaffected Mormon in 2015? Well, I think our uh, conceptualization of, of God, which we always speak of in very humble terms, because we recognize the limits of human language and understanding, would be one that affirms God as spirit, light, and truth, and love. Now, there are elements of that that can be integrated with what is emerging in some of the new physics understanding of the nature of reality, that everything is energy <laughs> and in relationship. So we offer an understanding of God that is experienced in relationality with others, in community. That's part of the reason for our name. So I think it's a God that is not in combat with findings of science, but actually provides an opportunity for integration of knowledge and, and, and faith in a healthy and productive way. We also uh, affirm uh, a God who is a suffering God. So we take seriously the human reality of suffering in the world. And God's intense involvement in that suffering. So it's not so much a vertical theology as it is a horizontal theology of God, if that makes sense. <laughs> and not a, f a physical God, uh, a body, especially not a male physical body God. So someone who's like, I'm not gonna be behind a male God I'm probably not going to be behind an anthropomorphic God, but I'm down with there being life, and I'm down with the possibility of some type of power, energy, or force. A ground of all being, um, ultimate truth, the holy other who is not me. Yeah. It's that all is one in some sense, all is part of this life, and... Certainly love is a good thing. So if somebody's like, that's as much as I can offer in terms of, that's as much form as I can put to God. Anything else is, I just, I can't go there because it's just too specific for something that's unknowable. If somebody just, that's as much as I can give in terms of God, your response would be what? Uh, you'll certainly find language, uh, symbols, uh, testimonies, and understanding of that experience and people who share that perspective. And would that person be viewed as inferior or lesser no. than in the community and no. they're not a real believer? Well, one of the phrases we use a lot is all truth and that we're always open to exploration, 
more understanding. Uh, so it's the honest searching that is really valued in, in community of Christ or in many parts of community of Christ. Okay. Uh, likewise with, with Jesus, Jesus is under assault in some sense. Did he really exist or not? Is there a historical Jesus? Um, and then even if there was a historical Jesus, which you know, reasonable people hold different views on that, um, whether or not a real literal resurrection happened is sort of something that some people maybe aren't, aren't prepared to go that far. It's like some people might believe that, but who knows whether he really was resurrected or whether we will literally resurrect. What does, what does community of Christ have to offer in terms of sort of those questions or sensibilities or concerns? And when you're asking uh, these questions, are you, you're talking about what's more normative? Uh, because one response is always going to be there is a spectrum of belief in the church. All are valued. We view the church as a tent, a large, a large tent. There are some boundaries out there, but people have to decide what their relationship is to the basic beliefs or, or affirmations of the church. And there's freedom and, and space to do that. But what's normative in the church is, yes, there was a historical Jesus, there's also the Christ of faith that began to be the understanding of the church as the church reflected on the life and ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus as it had been experienced in the community. Something happened <laughs> that indicated that death was not the final word on the matter. And the church called that resurrection. And you have the testimonies of people who say, we, we saw, we, we heard. That moves into a matter of faith then. Um, so you would have a spectrum of belief from resurrection as literal bodily resurrection. On an individual basis. On an individual basis. Or for Jesus, Jesus's resurrection. Um, a glorified body, a resurrected body that's different than the physical human body, the gospel witness, don't touch me, you know, that Jesus said. To those who see resurrection as a principle that God is always bringing life and new life out of that which appears to be dead and lifeless. And that that's the most important truth that comes out of those scripture passages and stories, ever how you, you view them. So throughout the church, there would be a variety of, of beliefs and people would be respected with those beliefs. The boundary, if somebody said, uh, basically, there was no Jesus, we're not gonna reference Jesus, forget Jesus, that would be a boundary. I mean, when you're called community of Christ, obviously you're focused in a, in a certain direction. What if somebody is saying, I don't believe in, in I don't believe in God, I, I identify as an atheist, and um, I tend to think that Jesus may or may not have been historical, but I don't believe in the literal resurrection, but I like the teachings of love. So it's just sort of a, I'm okay with believers, I'm not necessarily identifying as one, but I really love the teachings of Jesus and I like being in a friendship where those sorts of teachings are encouraged. Yeah. Can that person be baptized? Yeah, that okay. person could be baptized because we understand the conditions of repentance as being part of baptism, but repentance is, are you searching? Are you, are you looking <laughs> towards the truth or are you in rebellion. Um, so we tend to look to the possibilities in terms of a person's ongoing journey and we want to preserve those opportunities uh, with them. Now, in some specific congregations of the church, 
that might be viewed differently. But in general, I would say that individuals with that perspective would welcome, be welcome to participation, wouldn't, wouldn't be preaching every Sunday because the community itself would have certain expectations in terms of what's proclaimed in terms of the, the public message or the public theology of, of the church. I, I was listening to a podcast recently about the United Church of Canada and how at least one female pastor began identifying as atheist um, and is now under review by the church and, and her sort of ministry is in jeopardy. Yeah. Could, could someone who self-identifies as an agnostic or an atheist publicly become a pastor, do you think? And if, and if a pastor began identifying as atheist or agnostic, could that jeopardize their ministry, their office? I, I think, honestly, it could, could jeopardize it, but not out of any desire to be uh, legalistic or to discipline, but because of the expectations and shared beliefs of the faith community, that person would not be selected or supported to be in a leadership role. They would still be welcomed and encouraged to be part of the fellowship and people would listen seriously to their questions and think about it and, and respond. But I think the community it's, itself would take a position on that as a, as a faith community. But not excommunicated? Not excommunicated. Okay. What, what does it take to get excommunicated in community of Christ? Well, uh, officially, it, it takes uh, murder or second offense adultery. <laughs> okay. Or unchristian conduct that is so blatant the person themselves has in effect removed themselves from the church. Now, I, at this point, I'd probably better check. Excommunication to us means a member not in good standing, not able to take the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Expulsion means removal of, of membership. So those former things were the grounds for expulsion? Those were some expressly stated grounds. For expulsion? Yeah. Okay. But there would be a process. Excommunication means can't take communion. Right. Okay. For you. Yeah. Got it. In the community of Christ tradition. Okay. And that person can be reinstated. So again, the focus is always towards reconciliation of the person with the community and to be, it is very, very rare. It can be appealed uh, all the way to the first presidency, but it's very, very rare. Okay. Hardly ever hear of it. Okay. Really quickly, your position on the Bible, and there's a lot of modern historical criticism that's actually lasted for over 100 years about is the Bible really the Word of God? Is it just passed down through oral tradition? There are contradictions yeah. in the Bible. There are questions about it. its historicity as well. What does Community of Christ have to say about the Bible? And all the atrocities in the Old Testament. Yeah. Wow. So we're, we're getting into to major topic, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I can just respond at a certain level. Sure. We have a, a statement on Scripture that we distribute throughout the church, and it has certain principles that uh, we uphold and affirm. And again, then people have to decide where are they in relation to that principle. And is this Doctrine and Covenants 163? Uh, no, the statement on Scripture okay. is in a resource called Sharing in Community of Christ, okay. which contains various foundational statements about the, the beliefs and mission of the church. And it's the primary reference for current church articulation of basic beliefs and the sacraments of the church and scripture and so forth. Okay. That statement affirms scripture as inspired. 
affirms the role of Scripture as indispensable as long as it's faithfully or responsibly interpreted. And that interpretation includes availing oneself to the um, scholarly information about historical context and meanings of the Scripture as it was understood at the time, how it can be understood and applied today. We see Scripture as a collection of uh, books of many voices that recount human encounter with the divine and the human response to that to describe the experience of encountering the divine. We do not affirm scripture as literally infallible. So we don't hold scripture as the words of God. But within Scripture, you can find the living Word of God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All Scripture falls under the lens of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. So we would look at the Old Testament through the lens of Christ and the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, because we believe that God's most decisive revelation was in Jesus Christ, a, a, a life. So we don't equate the Word of God with words, but the words point us to encounter with the Word of God. And the Word of God is the livingness of God in creation, creating still, and God's revelation in, in Jesus Christ, and then how we continue to encounter that. Um, so the indispensable, we would affirm it as inspired, indispensable, not literally inerrant or infallible in every detail, as a collection of books with many voices that have to be understood both in their historical context and then responsibly interpreted for application in life today. And the Spirit helps us do that. I, you'll have to forgive me for quoting your scripture, but I, you know, this is, um, this is Doctrine and Covenants section 163 um, of Community of Christ scripture. And um, it's amazing. Uh, so this is uh, verse 7, is that how you'd say it? Section 163, verse 7, B. Um, any idea when this was given, when this was made, Scripture? I'm looking if your heading has like a year where yeah. it was. I know I'm not going to put you on the spot to give a year, but I, I don't see a year here. But a decade, approximate, any idea? About five years ago. About five years ago? Were you were you president prophet? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this came out through you. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's a prophet, seer, and revelator. Okay, here we go. Um, it says scripture is not to be worshipped or idolized. Only God, the eternal uh, one, of whom scripture testifies, is worthy of worship. Um, uh, God's nature is revealed in Jesus Christ and affirmed by the Holy Spirit provides the ultimate standard by which any portion of Scripture should be interpreted or applied. That's beautiful. C, it is not pleasing to God when any passage of Scripture is used to diminish or oppress races, genders, or classes of human beings. Much physical, physical and emotional violence has been done to some of God's beloved children through the misuse of Scripture. The church is called to confess and repent of such attitudes and practices. Um, scripture, prophetic, prophetic guidance, knowledge, and discernment in the faith community must walk hand in hand to reveal the true will of God. Follow this pathway, which is the way of the living Christ, and you'll discover more than sufficient light for the journey ahead. Now that inspires me. Like that's, that's amazing. Like. I like, it feels like a hot shower on a, after a long day's work to read scripture 
that is informed by, I, I don't know if you would characterize it this way, but it's informed by modern or even progressive sensibilities. And again, I don't know if you're allergic to those adjectives, but for <laughs> me, it's like, I like this. Like, I don't know what I think about God or religion or Jesus, but like, that is good. That is wholesome and noble and worthy and revealing and enlightening and inspiring. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking two things. I'm thinking, holy moly, like what was the beautiful thing that Joseph Smith revealed? This notion of ongoing revelation. Mm -hmm. Yay, but because, because the doctrine and theology he was facing, children don't go to heaven if they die before eight and you know, animosity, but turn church, so much exclusivity, like racism, like, yeah, he, he moved the ball forward about how people talk about Christianity from my value standpoint. And part of how he moved that forward is by saying, hey, not only can people receive personal revelation, but churches and a prophet can receive modern revelation. Mm -hmm. And new light knowledge like that's the whole selling point of the lds sort of missionary program and yet i don't know if we've had like one or two sections added to the doctrine and covenants after joseph died and they were just most of most of what was added was declarations sort of undoing sort of lame teaching or lame practices of the past polygamy and racism but like where is the the further light knowledge added to the scriptures so that's my bias but I'm going to ask you to respond to what I see as the beautiful thing about what you're doing, which is like there is there are new sections added to your Doctrine and Covenants sort of every decade average of how many new sections do you think? Several. Several? Two. One um, or two. Uh, yeah. And, and, um, and they're beautiful. So, you know, how, how many sections if you even have the number, how many sections have you been responsible for adding? Um, 163 and 164, which follows. And currently, I have shared some words of counsel with the church that will be considered at our world conference coming up in June of 2016 for inclusion in the Doctrine and Covenants. And now that I have my uh, years straight, that was in 2007. Okay. 163. Okay. Yeah. And you would describe 163 as being generally about what? Mm. Um, w one of the challenges of speaking about Revelation is, is finding the words. But what it is about is a living God who is wanting us, the human creation, to be vulnerable to God's grace and to be transformed by it. And whatever it is in our lives that causes us, us to put up um, resistance or shields or defensiveness to being touched and blessed by God's grace um, can stand in the way of what God really wants us to have and experience in, in our lives. Uh, I was fairly new as president of the church having been only ordained in 2005. Um, but that, what became Section 163 became a, a powerful experience for me in my own understanding of God when I encountered that kind of love and light that I always believed in, but it became even more real through the experience of uh, shaping words and speaking words that the church considered to be worthy of being included in the Doctrine and Covenants as part of the church's understanding of who God is. Uh, the one on uh, the nature of Scripture was particularly profound because for me, in my experience, 
because it spoke to so many issues that people are in conflict about. And they're, they're hitting each other over the head with their Bibles, assuming a particular way of reading the Bible and doing a lot of emotional and relational violence and allowing a lot of physical violence to occur. And that's just not right. And it became, I knew that, but it came very clear to me when God said that's not right, if I can use those terms. <laughs> when God said what's not right? To use scripture that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To dominate, oppress, do violence. And so, I, I, you know, you go back, slavery, and how people used certain passages in the Bible out of context as a support for the institution of slavery and proved it from certain biblical text was, was wrong and misinformed. The oppression of women using certain text, especially Pauline text or from the apostle Paul is a misunderstanding and a misuse of scripture that totally ignores historical context and other writings of Paul. So, yeah, if scripture is to speak to the nature of God and the living word, then it should never be used in ways that are so contrary to our understanding of the nature of God and who Jesus is. We are the ones who have misunderstood and misapplied. And so, and I wanted to ask this earlier, but it's, a, it's an okay time, I think. So if someone were to read the, the principal narrative of the Book of Mormon that says that God turned people's skin dark because of their wickedness, how would you look at that? How would you justify it? Yeah, I've, I've read just, various apologetics and justifications, but I think it's a scripture we need to understand in its historical context and set, a, set aside and, and move on with the broader witness of scripture. As I understand it, uh, the, the more uh, universal passages that, that speak to truth across time and, and culture. And I've been sad uh, with some of my African-American friends and associates uh, that those passages in the Book of Mormon have been a barrier to their relationship with, with God. And so when I have to choose, I move to my interpretive lens, which is God's revelation in Jesus Christ, and interpret Scripture through that. And I'm, I'm able to sort things out so maybe that teaching, maybe it was prejudice on the part of the Nephites, or maybe if, if it was something that, that maybe Joseph, it was a product of his environment, something other than really what God did. Right. True? Yes. So God did not curse people with dark skin in your belief? In my belief, no. Okay, so the Book of Mormon gets that wrong. And, and that's okay, because scripture doesn't have to be right all the time. And scientifically, um, there's a lot of evidence that we all descended from an African woman. <laughs> so you're okay with evolution? Well, we can get into quite a discussion of different schools of, of evolution. But yeah, there's certainly uh, space in my understanding of how creation comes into being and unfolds. That includes principles of, that are described by evolutionary science, but you have to be careful totally identifying with certain schools of that, because I believe there's a creative impulse that is God that's involved in, in all of that. But certainly not a 6,000 or 7,000 year old earth. No. And certainly not an Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago being the first humans. No, that would be a literal understanding of scripture. And that's in your Doctrine and Covenants too, right? Yeah. Okay. But it, it reflects a type 
of scriptural literature that included stories about creation. So I need to look deeper in that story to understand the truth that's being communicated. Okay. So at a higher level, I think LDS folks are raised to think that sort of the prophet picks up a telephone and talks to God almost audibly, that it's a very direct communication with, with very concrete language, mm -hmm. and that, and for us, that's it. It's that the, the, the prophet talks to God in Jesus. They get that personal, see Jesus, you know, talk to God, like, oh, you want, oh, this is the revelation? Okay, let me write that down. You know, okay, church, here's the revelation, you know. Even though that's not happening a lot these days, in theory, that's supposed to be what we believe in. Um, and it's a very direct thing. And the prophet is like the most righteous person maybe on the earth, and again, God's buddy, you know, co-managing co God's children together in a very verbal and direct way. Um, what is it like to be prophet? Hmm. Is it like that? Is it something different than that? Is there any of that going on? <laughs> uh, it's, it's not like that. Um, so revelation. It's our, under, our belief, our understanding, and our experience that God is self-revealing. So that's the core of the doctrine of revelation. That's an expression of love and desire for relationship with creation. Revelation, from my experience, and also my study, but especially from my experience, is encounter with the reality of God. Light, truth, love. At that point, we begin to try to describe that. We use our human language. We use symbols. We use stories. We use metaphors. We use, every, we use poetry we, to try to explain that. And the Holy Spirit inspires that. But it is not just being uh, the recipient of nouns and verbs that you automatically write down on paper. So that is my experience with, with Revelation. It's a, I would describe it as a heightened sense of encounter with God and then using every fiber of one's being to communicate that with the help of the Holy Spirit. But it is communicated in language through a human being in human culture. And so we believe that the Holy Spirit helps others through those words to have the same encounter. So the written record of Revelation is an attempt to describe the experience. But in some ways, it's always limited because human mind and human being has been involved in it. it it's, it's both has been my experience. My experience of Revelation is you don't schedule it, uh, you don't turn it on and off, that your responsibility in this kind of role is to be prayerfully open, aware, observant, and listening. And over time, you have moments of encounter with God when certain truth, certain themes begin to emerge, like this paragraph on Scripture. And then what I do is spend time with that to make sure it's not Steve. 
And it's not just an expression of my emotion. It's not my agenda for the church. And if there is a persistent prompting over time, and then a peace at the core of one's being that frees you to proceed, that's when I proceed with sharing such words with the church, with my testimony of the need to share these words at this time. In the community of Christ, then, the whole community becomes involved in mutual discernment at that point. I, I hand it to the church and say, I trust the church in its capacity to come to understand what the status of these words should be. And then after time of prayer and discussion, there's very open discussion at our world conference where people ask questions, they push back, they affirm. Do they recommend edits? Uh, they can, but edits don't happen in the integrity of the document itself. So, so by the time you submit it for consideration, there's no editing? Not from the body, but it's considered carefully, and at any point, I, as prophet president, could withdraw it, or the conference could not approve it. Has that ever happened? Something been withdrawn or something been rejected? The prophet president has been asked to take matters back to the Lord and bring some additional explanation and guidance but the original document as well as additional counsel were eventually were brought to the world conference so things have been added to based yes. on questions but it came from the prophet right um if the conference were to not accept words of counsel for inclusion in the doctrine and covenants then the prophet president would decide what to do um, and most typically it would be, okay, the church wasn't ready. We need to spend some more time with this. There are questions that need to be answered, so you stay in a fairly dynamic process. Or you could decide you were wrong and need to step out. <laughs> um, I, per I perceive you and I perceive your church's approach as being one of a very large measure of humility. And indeed, you mentioned humility is one of the very first words you referenced when you were speaking about scripture or revelation, I believe, if my memory is correct. Um, and yet, um, the idea of someone speaking for God, or even attempting to discern God's will, um, would be one that I think could easily cause someone to sort of shrink in mm -hmm. out of a out of a desire to not have any hubris to to avoid hubris to avoid arrogance to avoid the presumptiveness of really knowing God's will, right? Yes. Do you do you resonate with any of those fears or concerns or hes hesitancies? I, and how have you coped with that? Yeah, I, I struggle with that all the time. Uh, in my humanness and in my understanding of, of God, I, I really struggle with that. Um, I cannot deny that there have been times when I have been touched or inspired or blessed by something outside of me. Um, and so that's been there, and that's through the grace of God. I also believe very strongly in the church's responsibility to journey 
with the prophet president in discerning the call of God. So there have been times as I've approached sharing documents with the church, the human part of Steve going, what in the world am I doing? And then with the nudges of the Spirit saying, present it and trust the church in its discernment of the word. So your role is to remind the church of its prophetic responsibility. And when it's a shared responsibility, it's not just one person speaking ex cathedra or infallibly or with all authority. So we would hold in relationship prophetic guidance and common consent what we call common consent in the life of the church. And that is, it has to be affirmed, embraced, discerned by the church before it's included in the Doctrine and Covenants as authoritative and normative for the church. Is that just majority, is that majority rule? Like, uh, like when they do the vote on section 163, is it just 51% yes, then it's in? Well, that would be uh, the minimum. Okay. But that's enough. It hasn't been, that's enough. However, uh, in our journey with what is really consent, we are experimenting at our world conference with a different kind of process that would require a higher level of common consent of the delegates in order to make certain major decisions as a church. And so we're growing in our understanding that sometimes 51% in the majority doesn't represent really the consent or the support of the, of the whole church. But right now, that would, that would be the minimum it would, by a majority.